Welcome to the Jones Seminar. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Brent Minchu, who's giving our Jones Seminar today. Um, Brent is originally from Texas. We won't hold, him against, hold that against him. Um, and before becoming a scientist, Brent was a Marine. Um, and then he went back to school. He went to UT Austin for his undergraduate and master's degrees. Um, before uh, going to Caltech for his PhD. He then spent a couple of years um, at the British Antarctic Survey um, in Cambridge, UK, um, before joining the faculty at MIT. Brent's going to be talking about some really interesting work on kinematic waves on glaciers and showing some possibly Emmy award-winning uh, videos in here. So take it away, Brent. Yeah, way to set expectations, too. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you, Colin, for the unreasonable expectations are unrealistic. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for coming. This is actually a great crowd relative to what I was told to expect. Um, and I don't know how many people are on Zoom, but thanks for joining on Zoom uh, as well as in person. Uh, yeah, so as Colin mentioned, uh, my name is Brent Minshew. Uh, I am interested in a whole host of problems associated with uh, the dynamics of glaciers and the usage of remote sensing observations, typically from satellites, occasionally from aircraft, and we'll get to the end a little bit talking about some new drones that we're thinking about designing. Uh, but I'm, I'm very interested in kind of how things uh, change on short time scales and how we can make observations of changes over short time scales and infer uh, various physical properties. So as per usual, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is in collaboration with a whole host of other folks. I just happen to be the one standing up here in front of you talking about it and the one who sometimes pays the bills on things, but in particular, uh, acknowledge work from... Uh, from a friend and colleague, Brian Reel, uh, Ian Jockin provided some of the data that we're going to talk about, and then there's a whole host of other things, uh, particularly by the students within the group, and I'll try to call those contributions out individually as we go on. Let's see if I can't figure out how to advance slides. There we go. Okay, glacier dynamics. This is the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. It is essentially the greatest hits of geophysics. Uh, that is, that it, kind of any of the problems and things that people think about uh, in terms of geophysics, classically defined uh, about solid Earth, uh, motion of the mantle, and this kind of thing. Uh, a lot of that is present uh, within the ice sheets themselves. Another way of putting that is to basically say that the ice sheets are kind of interesting and exciting to study because they're geological processes that are playing out over human time scales and places that we can observe them really, really well. All right. So some overarching questions and thinking about geodynamics, of course, is how do ice sheets respond to changes in climate, right? How do they respond to the transport of heat through the oceans? How do they respond as the atmosphere warms up? Precipitation patterns change, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the corollary question and thinking about how do glaciers uh, and ice sheets shape the solid earth, right? Glaciers are one of the primary agents of erosion. They're flowing along at relatively high, uh, high speeds and some places sliding along their beds at, uh, at high rates. So how does that process erode the solid earth, deposit sediment, create some of the landforms that we live with, and so on and so forth? Now, within the field and the kind of stuff that I try my best to contribute to uh, on some level, uh, typically behind the scenes of thinking about the physics, but trying to address uh, what is, uh, I would argue is the central challenge of glaciology to make testable, ultimately reliable predictions in response to glaciers and ice sheets to changes in climate to include sea level rise. Right? So, Ideally, at the end of the day, the kind of stuff that I do feeds into the kind of stuff that Matthew and Helen do in and, and, and dealing with actual large-scale models and actually properly making projections and so on and so forth. So in thinking about this and thinking about this central challenge and the response of ice sheets and, and sea level rises and things of this nature, uh, the dynamic response of glaciers and ice sheets is really a key component. Uh, and understanding the dynamic response and how it sets rates of sea level rise uh, changes in, uh, in the ice sheets, erosion, deposition of the solid earth, things of this nature. All of this stuff relies on having reasonably good constraints of the rheology of the ice, so as the deformation of the ice from the viscous all the way through to the brittle regimes, as well as understanding the mechanics of the bed. So trying to get at making observations to give us a better understanding of what's happening in the mechanics of the bed, the interaction between glaciers and the solid earth, is what we're going to talk about here today. Before we do that, we'll kind of set the stage. Uh, we'll tell a story that's going to be familiar to some of you, perhaps new to others of you and so forth. Uh, but it all kind of boils down to thinking about and understanding uh, the changes that are currently underway in Antarctica so that we can get at a better understanding of what changes may be in store for us uh, into the future. So this is, uh, this is a slide uh, that I stole from NASA. 
uh, just gives a sense of the, the, the observed mass changes uh, around in and around Antarctica uh, using a, a series of satellite uh, observations known as GRACE and GRACE follow-on and so forth. This is just a pair of satellites that are flying along that are measuring the distance between the satellites very precisely. And so whenever they, they feel any sort of a mass anomaly, the leading satellite speeds up, uh, opens the distance between the two satellites as they pass over. That distance closes and then opens back up again. And by measuring this sort of accordion effect between the two satellites, people are able to measure our mass losses, or at least mass changes, uh, within the ice sheet. So the general view that's going on here, shown in the plot here, uh, shown in units in this case of gigatons, which is a totally useless unit if you don't think about this kind of thing all the time. To give you some intuition of this, a gigaton of ice is, a, is an ice cube that's about a kilometer uh, on each side. Uh, so that, ga- that, that mass comes up to about you know, um, roughly two times the mass of all humans on Earth, so it's, it's, it's a big chunk of mass. Uh, and in general, uh, the ice sheet in Antarctica over, this, over the satellite record, at least, is losing about 150 or so gigatons of mass per year. <laughs> mass. Sub- substantial rate. I don't know if somebody's asking a question or that's just, just talking in. That does remind me, though, if you have questions, I'm perfectly happy for you to interrupt me. So just shout them out, throw something large and heavy at me, whatever it is that you need to do to get my attention, uh, but, but feel free to ask questions, right? Okay, so all this mass loss comes around to something like 3,000 gigatons uh, over this observational record. Um, that's a whole lot of mass that's being lost, but of course the oceans are large, and so this contributes to about 8 millimeters or so of sea level equivalent, or about 1 one-hundredth of 1% of the total mass within Antarctica. But kind of some interesting features over here in terms of the spatial scale. So you have the, the, the time-dependent uh, plot over here from total mass loss in Antarctica. And then the, the spatial structure of this mass loss, of course, is quite interesting. Uh, so warmer colors indicate uh, a, a greater amount of mass loss uh, in the area. Cooler colors indicate generally a net mass gain. So lots of interesting signal going on. We won't go into all of it, but basically the thing that your eye is probably drawn to is this particular area around in here. This is the Amundsen Sea, so the Amundsen Sea embayment in this area, a place where most of the mass loss is occurring in Antarctica, and enough of it is is occurring even in the presence of this mass gain to give us a sort of total net mass loss uh, from the continent. Why is this sort of thing happening? It all relates to uh, the, the, the response of the dynamic, uh, the dynamics of the ice to effectively ocean warming. So the way that works out, real quick story for those of you who are not familiar with it, these are observations of surface velocities that are collected in Antarctica, a collected sort of compilation of lots and lots of satellite observations uh, that have been collected over the years. And they're all stacked together to give us this one general coherent view of what's going on. So you'll notice kind of lighter colors around here, slower flow, darker colors are the faster flowing areas, the slower flow kind of dominated over most of the continent, but then the relatively fast-flowing areas, you can see these things starting to pick up uh, in these streaming-like features. These are the fast-flowing glaciers and ice streams, the kind of things that we're particularly interested in. And then they flow into these big areas that are flowing relatively fast. We have the continental U.S. in the background for scale, so these large areas of fast flow. Uh, These can be, in some cases, around the size of Texas. This one around here is the size of California and so forth. So these are the floating ice shelves. Uh, So they are the floating extensions of the ice sheet, And they're kind of where a lot of the changes uh, are taking place, or a lot of the drivers of the changes are taking place. So basically, in a nutshell, what happens is that virtually every snowflake that falls in Antarctica is eventually compressed into glacier ice. It flows through one of these fast-flowing glaciers and ice streams and ends up on one of these ice shelves where it's lost to the ocean, either by melting off the base of the ice shelf or calving off the front of the ice shelf. So the story that we're telling today, or at least in terms of the mass losses that we're seeing, is, is primarily related... Uh, to uh, melting along the base of the ice, thinning of the ice shelf, and so forth. So if we're interested in melting, what we're interested in then is the temperature of the ocean around it. So this is just the mean temperature of the ocean taken from observations. These have been interpolated in space, and then they're averaged over the depths that are relevant for the floating ice shelves themselves. The ice shelves now are grayed out to give you a general sense of what's going on. So around most of the continent... What you can see is that relatively cool ocean water has gotten up onto the continental shelf. It's coming into contact with these floating ice shelves. But in a few areas, like the Bellingshausen Sea sector out here, the Amundsen Sea sector in this area, it's relatively warm ocean water that is getting up onto the continental shelf, coming into contact with the floating ice shelves. In general, where we see warm water coming into contact with the ice shelves, we see those ice shelves thinning. So what we're plotting here now is observations of the thickness of the ice shelf, or at least changes, the rate of change in the thickness of the ice shelf 
taken from satellite altimeters kind of over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so. This is a little bit dated, uh, dated now at this point. It's taken from Fernando Paolo's paper in 2015, but you know, roughly the spatial pattern uh, holds the same. So in general, when we look around uh, where we see relatively cool ocean water onto the continental shelf coming into contact with the floating ice shells, we see the ice shells roughly maintaining their thickness. But in these areas, like the Amundsen Sea Sector, we see significant rates of thinning up to several meters or so per year where the warm water is coming into contact with the floating ice shelves. In general, in some of these areas where we see the ice shelves thinning from observations, we see the glaciers and ice streams that are feeding those ice shelves speeding up. And this is the sea level contribution that we get from Antarctica, the net mass loss that we saw within the gravity observations before. Here, warm colors are indicating uh, this total net speed up. Again, these, these data are fairly dated at this point in time, but nonetheless, uh, Pine Island, which is this glacier, Thwaites in this area, they are kind of showing a general net speed up uh, over time. The reason why this sort of thing is happening has to do with the changes in stresses, the resistive stresses that take place within the ice shelf itself. Okay, so ice shelf thinning reduces the resistive stresses, what we sometimes refer to as the buttressing stresses of the ice shelf. So basically the ice shelf is coming out, it's the floating extension of the ice sheet, it doesn't really experience any drag along its base, but where it is confined along its lateral margins or comes into contact with discrete pinning points uh, in certain areas, then those contacts are enough to provide some resistive forces or the buttressing stresses that will uh, that resist the seaward flow of the glaciers. Right? So whenever warm water is coming up into contact with these things and thinning the ice shelf, it sort of reduces the structural integrity of the ice shelf, so to speak. It reduces its ability to resist ice flow and allows the ice to flow more freely. At the same time, the reduction in buttressing can cause a retreat of the grounding line itself. The grounding line is this line here. So we have the glacier flowing from the grounded ice down to the floating ice. And the boundary that's separating these two things is referred to as the grounding, as the grounding line. That's simply the point where the weight of the ice balances the buoyancy and the ice is going to float, right? So that position in general is quite sensitive to the amount of buttressing that's provided by the ice shelf. So if you thin the ice shelf and you reduce the buttressing, you can drive a retreat of the grounding line. And that matters a lot because in a lot of grounded glaciers, particularly those that are sliding along their base, is the drag that's provided at the bed that is one of the primary resistances to ice flow. So whenever you re retreat the grounding line, you separate the ice from the bed, you put an inviscid layer effectively between the two, you lubricate the bed, everything flows more freely, right? So all of these things, these two, these two factors combined, the reduction of buttressing as well as the retreat of the grounding line, allows for greater flux of ice to the ocean and hence sea level rise within Antarctica, right? And so this, di this dynamic response really makes ice shells this critical vulnerability of the ice sheets to changes in climate. Ice shells are the northernmost extent of the ice sheet. They're generally at lower elevation and so forth, and so they'll respond quite quickly. All right? The dynamic response of the glaciers is sensitive, at least to some extent, to the mechanics of slip at the bed, and that's the problem that we're really mostly interested in. And one of the, the big things that we're really interested in and understanding uh, within my research group. So take a step back real quick from the specific problem that we're talking about and think about the kind of things that we do within my research group to address this, as well as a host of other questions we can think about kind of breaking things down along the lines of the fundamentals that we like to focus on, using remote sensing observations, using hierarchy of models, simple physical models, out to more complex models, and so forth. Everything we do in my group tends to focus on the fundamental mechanics of the system and how the systems are responding. And so, of course, for fundamental mechanics, this all boils down to thinking about conservation equations. So we have we have projects going on and thinking about conservation of mass, that is how we can use remote sensing observations to try to understand uh, time varying melt and thinning uh, of the ice shelves, particularly as we get close to the grounding line and so forth. We have, uh, we have projects working on uh, thinking about how to uh, test different models for the momentum balance. So the governing equations of ice flow is something that we're gonna get to uh, toward the end of this talk. We have projects going on and thinking about the energy balance within the ice, so thinking about the partitioning of, of deformational energy between heat uh, and strain energy and so forth, and the things that go into the recrystallization of ice and whatnot. We have a number of projects going on and thinking about constitutive relations that is specifically related to the viscosity of the ice, calibrating the parameters of ice viscosity and so forth from observations and whatnot. And then, of course, we think about boundary conditions, and that's what we're talking about here today, and thinking about ways in which we can kind of push ahead and think a little bit more deeply about the mechanics of slip uh, at the bed, right? 
But everything that we do, we basically strive to illuminate clear and concrete connections between observations and first principles physics. There's just some examples uh, from my group's research. I wanted to put this up here. This is work from Joanna. I know some of you know Joanna. Joanna was an undergraduate here at Dartmouth. I think she maintains relatively strong connections to this department. Uh, so Joanna is a PhD uh, student with me. Well, she's now a PhD candidate because she passed her qualifying exams and so forth and is on to bigger and better things. Uh, but she's doing uh, a number of cool things. And I just wanted to put this, this one up here. This is actually my bad. This is dated. This is, uh, this is in review. This paper is actually well on its way to, to being published now at this point in time. Uh, but this thing about ice rheology, the creep mechanisms that give rise to the viscous flow of ice and whatnot. Uh, the goal here is to, to validate and calibrate a flow law for natural glacier ice, which is effectively to test uh, and calibrate uh, Glenn's flow law, which for those of you who are interested in it or those of you who know about it, it's just a power law relation between the rate of deformation and the deviatoric stresses that are applied. A uh, big open question in the field that's kind of hung around for a long time is what is N and what is the prefactor and whatnot. And so what Joanna's done is gone in and taking lots of the observations that we have, like the satellite velocity fields that you saw before, uh, and picking out particular areas of the, of the ice shelves where we can, to a good approximation, constrain stresses independently of strain rates, and thus we can try to calibrate what this flow law is. And so what you're showing down here is one of the results of this is just a distribution of the inferred value of the exponent, and we get a value of kind of about 4.1, somewhere around in there, uh, which is slightly higher than the canonical value of 3. Go for it. What's that? Why are the large areas? I would expect it to be more uneven. Why the large area? I'm not sure I understand your question. So why are these areas relatively large compared to these pieces, and why is it non-uniform? So this is just illustrating the um, the, the ice shelves themselves, the, the size of the ice shelves. And so these ice shelves, for example are very large because the ocean is relatively cold and they're in these embayments, and so it allows them to kind of grow to, to large sizes with some lateral uh, shear stresses and whatnot to, uh, to house them, whereas these areas, there's no such embayments and so forth, and so they're going to generally have a calving front sort of at the extent of the, the rocky edge of the continent. Does that, does, that, does that answer your question, or did I? More melting. Yeah. Oh, so this, this isn't melting. Uh, th this doesn't have anything to do with melting. Um, these particular colors are simply showing the location of these inferred distributions for the rheology and the viscosity of the ice. Right? So this just gives you, basically in a nutshell, um, I skipped over this kind of quickly because I have a whole bunch of this in a, in a whole other talk. But effectively, what we're doing is we're looking at portions of the ice shelf uh, that are primarily in an extensional flow regime. And if they're in an extensional flow regime, then we can relate the deviatoric stresses to the local ice thickness, which is something that we can measure independently of the deformation rate of the strain rate, which is the gradient of the velocities. That's another observation that we have, right? And so what we've done is we've done that uh, and done a, a variety of fits to this. There's a variety of linear regressions and whatnot. Um, run a kernel density method on this to try to estimate what the, the uncertainty is and the inference of this, this exponent here. So we're basically plotting the log of this versus the log of that, looking at the slope and whatnot. And so these colors are simply meant to represent the geographic location of this particular estimated distribution over here. Right? And so all you're seeing over here is just the location of the ice shelves themselves, not necessarily the precise areas where we're using the data. But yeah, does that answer your question? All right, other examples of stuff that's going, to my, uh, going on in my group. Uh, we've done a lot of things. Actually, I met Colin years ago uh, to start working on thinking about the problem of the mechanics of glacier beds and thinking about surging glaciers. So surging glaciers are just, just uh, things where the glacier is flowing along happily in somewhat of a quiescent stage and relatively slow, and then all of a sudden, for reasons that we don't fully understand, it'll speed up to one or two orders of magnitude faster than its typical flow speed. Uh, move a bunch of uh, ice mass uh, downstream, thin out, do all kinds of, of wonderful things. And so we're interested in understanding what the triggering processes are, how these surges are initiated, uh, and whatnot. And so uh, Colin and I worked together uh, over the past, I don't know, five years or so, developed a theory of surge initiations in glaciers with deformable beds, so till at the bed, 
Uh, and this application, again, is getting at the mechanics of slip of the bed. Surges is an analog for tectonic faults and all kinds of fun things. I bring this up because what Colin and I did was a relatively idealized 1D model, uh, looking at the granular mechanics, so the mechanics of saturated uh, granular sediment uh, at the bed of the ice and so forth. And they have a student, a very talented student uh, by the name of Kasturi Shaw, who is taking and carrying this kind of thing forward, extending it into 2D, and thinking about wave propagation. So whenever we shear till in a, in a local area, we're going to dilate it, therefore it's going to change the pore water pressure and so forth. So that creates a pressure gradient at the base of the ice. And how does that pressure gradient uh, and the, the, the motion of the, uh, of, of the water within the till itself interact with the dynamics of the glacier, which is flowing at a different rate over top of it and whatnot. And so that kind of gets us to the theme of our talk today and thinking about waves on glaciers. So three broad types of waves on glaciers. There are water pressure waves that can move along the bed. So we have water pressure sitting at the base of the glacier. It's either poor water pressure within some sort of saturated deformable till or it's water pressure within a subglacial hydrological system and so forth. But either way, these water pressures matter because they set the effective pressure at the bed or essentially the lubrication of uh, the glacier uh, to the bed, right? So whenever we have any kind of localized changes in water pressure, then naturally we're going to create some pressure gradients, and thus there's going to be some communication of this pressure uh, through and along the bed. So that, these things are going to propagate as some sort of pressure wave along the bed. What we're really interested in today, though, is thinking about dynamical waves, which is the stress coupling within the ice. So if I just, hand of God, grab this bit of the ice, and I just jerked it along, then there's going to be some response. There's going to be some transmission of the stresses through the ice itself, and that transmission is going to cover some distance. It's going to attenuate out. It's going to move at some speed and so forth. And so that's the kind of thing that we're going to try to, uh, try to hammer down on in this particular talk and measure. And then there's kinematic waves, which is simply the redistribution of mass. So this is always a mass-limited system. If I speed up the glacier in one particular area, that means that in general I'm going to in increase the flux divergence. That means I, need, I must necessarily thin out the glacier and so on, and vice versa, right? And since it's gravity, gravitational driving stress uh, that, that is driving all the flow of these things, if I thin the glacier in one particular area, then that means I'm going to change the gravitational driving stress and thus change the flow of the glacier. And it's gen in general, I'm going to want to redistribute its mass through this thing known as a kinematic wave. The distinction between these two things is simply the direct coupling in the chain of the forces through the material. Okay? Now, we're interested in studying these waves, or I'm particularly interested in studying these waves, because the characteristic of wave propagation represents intrinsic properties of the glacier systems, right? And these are things that we can measure. We can measure the characteristics of wave propagations using observations, and then we can use that to try to pick out and understand what's going on, for example, between the coupling of the ice and the bed, right? And so this kind of thing, I would argue, is ideal, then, for illuminating the mechanics of slip along glacier beds. Key question of this talk, then, in this regard, is what is the relationship between the drag at the bed and the rate of slip or the rate of sliding along the bed itself? This relationship is typically referred to as the sliding law. It's the key mechanical basal boundary condition within ice flow models. And so we're going to stick to kind of a cartoon-level representation of the way we think about uh, the sliding law and the things that are happening at the bed of the glacier. Oh, this, this seminar starts at 30 minutes. Uh, I just looked at my clock and realized that it was almost the end of the hour and kind of panicked. But we started the 30 minutes. All right. So cartoon representation of kind of some broad scale thinking about what's going on at the bed of the glacier. We can start all the way to over here on the right hand side because this is the first thing that most glaciologists learn when they think about uh, sliding at the bed. This is one of the classical models of ice flow. Basically what's happening in this particular model, the bed is rigid. You have some water film that's separating the ice in the bed, and the ice is flowing along, and it's encountering one of the obstacles at the bed. So the ice can do one of two things when it encounters an obstacle. It can either flow around it, or it can effectively flow through it. And so there's a mechanism for flowing through it known as regulation, which simply takes into account the pressure melting condition of ice. So whenever you flow along, you, you encounter an obstacle. It increases the pressure on the upstream side. That changes the melting temperature, allows for the ice to melt. The water flows around the obstacle, it can refreeze on the back end, releases latent heat, flows through the obstacle, completes this chain and cycle of regulation. Similarly, uh, you can encounter a relatively large obstacle, so an, uh, an obstacle that's too large to really allow for the conduction of heat through this obstacle. And in that case, the ice has no, really no choice in general but to flow around that obstacle. And so the viscous flow uh, past the obstacle and roughness. 
And so as so we'll talk here in a second, there's some classic work by, by Wertman and a number of other people uh, that basically show that whenever you have this condition, what you have is a condition that we're just going to refer to as rate strengthening. So the faster I try to push ice past these obstacles, the more resistance that I'm going to have from these obstacles themselves. Okay? Skipping all the way over here on the left-hand side, we can recognize that ice is a relatively viscous fluid and that this water that exists down here is pressurized. And so if I'm flowing very fast, we may not have time for the viscous creep of the ice to actually come back down and start to fill uh, the voids between uh, these particular obstacles. So as I'm flowing faster and faster and faster, one would expect that my cavity sizes, my void spaces, to get larger and larger and larger, which means that the area of contact between the ice and the bed will decrease. And so the faster I flow, larger my cavities, lower the contact area between the ice and the bed, we would generally expect the drag then decreases with increasing velocity, a condition that we're going to refer to as rate weakening. And then finally, some stuff that we talked about before, particularly dealing with the surge models. And a deformable bed, if I have saturated sediment at the bed, then in general, wet dirt deforms as a plastic material. Right? So we're all familiar with things like a more Coulomb condition and so forth, where there's a yield strength of the bed that is a function of the effective pressure, the difference in overburden pressure and water pressure. That is the partitioning of the load between the fluid and the solid matrix of the material that ends up setting the yield strength of deformation of, uh, uh, of that material, right? And so, in general, if we're in a place where uh, sliding of the ice is facilitated by deformation, So with all these kind of broad scale models in mind, we can think about ways in which we can test which of these mechanisms uh, exist at the bed in any particular location. So I'd argue that for sufficiently small variations in the rate of slip, we're gonna call this U sub B, we can parameterize the drag at the bed tau sub B as simply a power law form, something that was originally derived for this, but we can generalize it to more or less anything. So positive values of the exponent, are gonna be rate strengthening, so the faster I go, the higher my drag. Negative values of the exponent would be rate weakening, so the faster I go, the lower my drag. And perfectly plastic values for this exponent, one over m. m is gonna to tend to infinity, so this dependence on the rate factor is going to drop out. And so with this in mind, then we can think about kind of what at least broad scale class mechanistic models we might expect to exist at the bed of the glaciers by trying to infer this value of the exponent and really hammer down on this broad scale of models. There's lots of other ideas about what this sliding wall could be and so forth, but many of them can at least be crudely approximated by a power law form where we simply allow the exponent to change according to the mechanism, okay? And this sort of thing matters, getting back to this broader idea of thinking about sea level rise, um, because the, the value of this exponent uh, tends to matter, at least to some extent, and what we get for projections. So this is just, this is some work that was done by Catherine Ritz uh, some years ago, but it looks at changing this value of the exponent and the resulting sea level equivalent that they get uh, for running their models. In a nutshell, the increased plasticity generally get uh, higher rates of, of sea level equivalent in these models. Other people have tested these things, come to slightly different conclusions, but the basic idea where you have a drag that is independent of the rate of deformation sort of would, would lend itself uh, at least in an intuitive sense, uh, to a condition where you're able to shed a little bit more mass, a little bit quicker, and so forth. So this idea of the sliding lawn and, and what it should be, what should the parameter values be, and so forth, has been around uh, for a long time. Uh, and it's something that more and more people are getting interested in. There's a lot of interesting ideas that are coming out uh, about this in uh, this day and age, and we're gonna attack this particular problem um, by taking advantage of the, this powerful new tool that we have and thinking about remote sensing time series. Another relatively dated slide, but the takeaway message more or less remains the same. It's something that I got from Twyla. What this represents is the, the, the radical increase in information that we have available to us now that simply wasn't available uh, just a few years ago. What's, what's important to take away from this this just happens to be taken in some random glaciers in Greenland. It doesn't really matter where they are. The takeaway has to do with the density of these dots on the plots. So each one of these dots represents a surface velocity observation. 
taken from satellite observations. So back in the 2000s, we get one, we step forward like five years, we get another, then we pick up sort of annual observations, and then another satellite flies, and we start to pick up a few observations per year, so we're starting to pick up this trend. Another satellite flies, as indicated by the black triangles and so forth, and we start to pick up seasonal variations and the trend and so on and so forth. And so it's this wealth of information that we have available to us now that we really want to take advantage of and understand what's going on. So in the time that we have left, we're going to think about uh, a couple of very simple problems. And some of you have seen me talk about this, this problem before, which is good because it kind of sets the stage for everything that we're doing, at least in terms of a methodological development. But loads of new information can be gleaned from these remote sensing observations. In particular, we're extremely interested in getting at high-resolution, time-dependent strain rate fields to understand fracturing of ice and so forth. I was talking to Erland about this earlier. Not quite ready to talk about these things yet, but hopefully we will be in another year or two. Uh, but today we're just going to talk about the response of fast-flowing glaciers to these non-local forcings, right? And in particular, we're going to focus on the upstream propagation of dynamic and kinematic waves. And again, the reason that we care about these things is they provide unique constraints on the mechanics of the bed, rheology of glacier ice, and all kinds of great stuff. So two examples we're going to go through, one in Antarctica, one in Greenland, we're going to move these, through these things kind of quick, and I'm going to tell you the future of this kind of work as we go forward. So our basic problem setup, we're going to try to infer the value of the exponent and the sliding law that we set up before as a power law relation. Our tools are going to be these new data formed in the dense remote sensing time series. And we're going to focus on natural experiments because that's the kind of research that we like to do. So Rutford Ice Stream, located in West Antarctica. Uh, it's a relatively fast-flowing ice stream. It's coming along the Ellsworth Mountains here. Uh, it's flowing into the Ronnie Filchner Ice Shelf, which is the second largest ice shelf uh, in Antarctica. What's interesting about Rutford for this kind of work is it has this very regular signal that we can do a decent job of constraining. So what we're showing down here are GPS observations of the along flow displacement. This is detrended displacement of the glacier velocity. So this is basically variations in velocity if you just you know phase shift this uh, in time. This is plotted relative to the vertical displacement of a GPS station that is plotted in blue and is located on the floating ice shelf. You can kind of see the grounding line in this particular image is a sinuous bit. This blue GPS station is located down here on the ice shelf in this area. So the vertical displacement, and then we've run this through a tidal model to clean these things up. So one of the things that you'll notice about the tides, you have this high frequency and this low frequency variability. All right, this low frequency variability is simply the spring neap tidal cycle. If you're not familiar with that, it just has everything to do with the alignment of the earth, moon, and the sun. Right? So whenever the Earth, Moon, and the Sun are in alignment, you get the spring tides, these maximum tides. Whenever the two are orthogonal, you get the minimum or the neap tides. The reason why this frequency is interesting is that this is the frequency of variability that we observe primarily in the horizontal flow of the glacier itself. Right? So the horizontal flow speed of the glacier is responding to this forcing from the tides. Now we're showing a lot more GPS data uh, in this particular case on this, on this upward plot. So the blue station the blue line is still indicating a station that's on the floating ice shelf. The black line is indicating a station that is at the grounding line itself. And then as we move from orange to dark red, we're stepping upstream in roughly 10 kilometer steps or so. So what you'll notice, clear sinusoidal variability that we pick out of this. That is carried all the way to a minimum of 40 kilometers upstream. You can see some damping of the amplitude. You see a phase offset here and so forth. And it's this signal that we really want to hammer down on. Okay. Come on. There we go. All right, so the way we do this is we just get a ton of data. Uh, so we have a bunch of synthetic aperture radar data. This is collected for us uh, from OSI, which is the Italian Space Agency. So they fly this constellation of satellites known as Cosmos SkyMed, four satellites that are virtually identical, and they are arranged in orbits that are very advantageous for this kind of work. So basically, if I'm standing on the ice sheet, a satellite flies over and observes my position. A day later, another satellite flies over, observes my position. Three days later, another satellite flies over, observes my position. Four days later, another satellite flies over, observes my position. Eight days later, the first satellite comes back over again, and the process repeats itself. So this gives us relatively short repeat time observations or a very high sampling rate for these observations. So Ozzy collected data for us for eight months. Uh, generally around the Austral summer, uh, along 32 unique and overlapping flight tracks. So that's the things that were being populated over here as I was talking before. 
So all these different flight tracks, you'll notice that there's this crossing pattern and a general blanketing of these flight tracks over this particular area. The crossing pattern is due to the fact that we collect data from both ascending orbits, so northbound satellite orbits, as well as descending orbits, southbound satellite orbits. Right? And this crossing is going to be very important for the things that we're going to want to do going forward and everything that we do after this. So once we have these observations, the way we do useful things with them and track velocity fields and so forth, as we take these observations in this one particular area, we're just focusing in on this bit, we take an observation, I'm plotting over here the amplitude of the radar image. It looks basically like a black and white photo that's going to be collected at some time. We're going to take another image from basically the same point in space, but at a different point in time. We'll select one of these as our primary scene, another one of these as our secondary scene. What we'll do is we'll cut a patch of data out over here, we'll slide it over here, we'll calculate the cross-correlation. We'll slide it, we'll calculate the cross-correlation, and so on and so forth, until we end up with this correlation surface for all these different positions. Right? The position of the peak correlation tells us about the displacement of this particular point and the time between these observations, and then the curvature of that surface tells us about the error in our observations. We repeat this sort of thing thousands and thousands of times, and we get this map of the displacement of the, of the satellite, right? In this particular case, what I'm showing you is a map of the, the displacement of the satellite along the radar line of sight, which is oblique to the surface, so it's sensitive to both horizontal and vertical displacement. And so you can see it has this general sense of the background flow field in this particular area. We can also, whenever we're doing this cross-correlation, we get offsets that are parallel to the satellite velocity vector, which are purely horizontal, and we get displacements along that area. All right, in this particular case, we end up with about 1,600 usable pairs of these observations around, and, and at least four unique viewing geometries because we have the ascending and descending orbits that are crossing one another's. And that gives us more than enough to constrain the horizontal and vertical velocities. The way we do this is we just chunk this all into a giant inverse problem. We start off with our prior knowledge. We had GPS observations. We know the periodicity of these things. And so we can construct a relatively simple model for the instantaneous displacement at any point on the glacier as being a function of the instantaneous velocity integrated in time. In this case, we're just doing everything in east, north, and up components. We can do it in whatever we want. And then we have some variability that's some family of sinusoidal terms. So things that we want to know in this case are indicated in blue. So things that we don't know about the variations or the amplitude and the phase of those variations, but we do know the frequency of those variations because we have GPS observations and because we understand how tides work and what their frequencies are and so forth, we can chuck all those things together. Now the observations themselves, the things that we observe from the satellite is simply some line of sight vector for example, the line of sight of the, the radar dotted into the actual displacement of the ice itself. So we can take this understanding, we can chuck it into a big inverse problem. So things that we know go into our design matrix, things that we don't know go into our model vector, and things that we actually observe go into our data vector. We run this inverse problem about 10 to the 8th times, and what we end up with are maps of all of those unknown pieces, which we can then put together and reconstruct, reconstruct what the time-dependent velocity fields look like. So this is a movie that I'm going to run forward. This is just a simple tidal model over here, show you where we are in the tidal cycle. The thing of interest is in the top right-hand side. This is the variability in the total flow speed, so the detrended velocity in this area and the response to tides. And so what you'll notice in this movie, we see this very strong response of the flow of the glacier, the horizontal flow of the glacier to the ocean tides. We see that response over the ice shelf, and then we watch that signal as it propagates upstream. All right, so there's a very clear propagation of this signal as it moves upstream. The signal is propagating about 30 kilometers or so per day, and it's attenu it has attenuation length scale. That is, its amplitude decreases by a factor of 1 over E after it propagates to about 45 kilometers or so. We hypothesize that it's changes in the buttressing stresses from the ice shelf that are likely changing uh, this flow variability, and I'm happy to talk with you offline about why that should be the case. So getting back to our general idea of how do we infer what's happening at the bed, the mechanics of the bed, and so forth, what we can do is we can set up a very simple dynamical model of wave propagation. We can just take our glacier. We can consider it to be a laterally confined glacier with a well-lubricated bed, which is consistent with the whole number of observations. So we have some lateral shear stresses in the margins, and we have some drag at the bed. Now the time scales that we're interested in, in this case, are tidal time scales. And so over these kind of time scales, we'd expect ice to be a viscoelastic material, right? And so we're going to model the ice 
That's simply a Maxwell viscoelastic material. That's just a spring and a dash pot in series. For those of you who are not familiar with it, so the ice is going to respond as an elastic solid over short time scales, viscous fluid over long time scales, but we're interested in something of an intermediate time scale in this particular case. So the relaxation time is what defines long versus short time, and that's simply the ratio of the dynamic viscosity to the shear modulus. Now we apply some periodic forcing of frequency omega. We know that forcing frequency because it's, we're, 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 it's, it's forced by the ocean tides. And we can chunk all this thing into a simple model, do a little bit of algebra, and end up with a dispersion relation that we can write down in terms of our unknowns and our observables. All right? We want the dispersion relation because it's relating, of course, our, our wave number or wavelength effectively to uh, the, the velocity and the attenuation of the glacier. All right? And so what we can do, we can just take this expression, we can just rearrange things in terms of the phase velocity, that is the rate of propagation of a constant value of phase uh, within our particular signal. We can relate the phase velocity to some unknown gamma term, as well as our omega term, and then this other term that we'll just call theta that's a function of our relaxation time of the ice, so physical property of the ice, and then the attenuation length scale we can work out in this way as well. So two equations and two unknowns. We can solve this relatively straightforward, plug in the observations that we get. We get a relaxation time of the ice of around 10 days or so, which is kind of, which is consistent with tabulated values that we would expect for ice that's roughly this temperature. And then we get this gamma term uh, that is the length scale of stress propagation and so forth. It's about 100 kilometers consistent with the observations that we get. There's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in gamma, uh, which we can talk about at length offline if you're interested in it, but sticking with our particular theme, we can just go straight in, we can rearrange some terms, and we can write out an expression for the ratio of the stress exponent and the rheology. So this is the, the stress exponent that goes into the viscosity, as well as the exponent that we're interested in in terms of our sliding law. And we can write this stuff out in terms of things that are either tabulated values or observables. So basically no free parameters in these things, except possibly for this time average basal drag term. Well, we have reasonably good uh, estimates for what the ratio between the gravitational driving stress and the basal drag should be. It can't be wildly uh, uh, off from, from a value of one and so forth. And then this phi term that we get is this big nasty algebraic expression, but there are no free parameters in it. Okay, So we can just take and we can plug in values to try to get an estimate of what the stress exponent is for a given value, or sorry, what the sliding law exponent is for a given value of the stress exponent within the rheological uh, factors. And this, in this particular range, kind of nails us down to this perfect plasticity range. So range of uncertainty actually ends up being very, very tight in this particular case, such that this value of M has to be incredibly large, indicating that the bed is, to a good approximation, perfectly plastic, which is quite consistent with a whole host of other observations. So saturated sediment is always well approximated as perfectly plastic. Um, the sediment was recently recovered uh, from beneath Redford and is currently being tested in the lab by uh, folks at Wisconsin and so forth. So the implications of this uh, is, is kind of neat, where we can, if we can, uh, if we can hammer everything down and basically say that the bed is, is something pro approaching perfectly plastic, then this provides a nice clear link between the drag that we can infer from surface observations and the water pressure at the bed, which is to say the drag just goes as the yield strength of the material, which goes as the effective pressure. Uh, essentially divided by two because the friction coefficient is one half to a good approximation. All right. Okay, so plenty of limitations on these things and bits that we can improve on going forward. So limitations in terms of scientific insight, what we get is this provides an estimate of sort of space and time average value of the exponent of the sliding law in a, in a given area. Um, and it gives us basically an effective or kind of a representative uh, slip mechanism for the glacier in this particular case, right? But it's not obviously generalizable. From a methodological perspective, the observational approach that we use only works in areas where we have a ton of prior information and in general we have relatively simple forcing functions. So we're carrying this stuff forward uh, to do a better job of, kind of developing some scientific insight uh, by sampling a whole range of settings we're trying to sample places that are going to have rigid bed, uh, rigid beds all the way up to deforming sediment beds of varying uh, water pressure at the beds and so on and so forth. From a methodological perspective, we need a much more sophisticated approach. We need some way to generalize the things that we're doing so that we can work on these things together. 
we need to have generalized time functions so that we can move toward kind of separating things out into basic categories of time averaged variations or secular variations, if you like that terminology, periodic variations, transient variations, and so forth. And we may need to be able to make robust inferences of all these things with relatively little prior information. And so that's the kind of thing that we're starting to do going forward. So moving to a different and much more complex setting, we can move to uh, Jakob Shav and Isbre, or also known as Cermak Kujalak, uh, located on the west coast of Greenland. It's one of the fastest flowing glaciers in the world, and it has this really strong seasonal signal. So this is what we're getting from the observations over here on the right-hand side. So watching the change in the flow of Jakob Shavin, and in particular, watching this signal as it's propagating upstream and so forth, right? So taking all the observations that we have, stacking these things together in a particular way that allows us to glean a lot of information out of it, right? So in this particular methodology, what we're able to do is take raw satellite data that's processed just like it was uh, before on Redford, but now we're able to use a generalized set of temporary this particular method that we developed is that we're able to take these observations in and we can decompose the signal into components of the signal that have short time scale, seasonal variability, and long time scale, and multi-year components. So that's what we've done. So total flow components, breaking these things out in terms of seasonal velocity variations, as well as transient velocities in this area. And we can look at how these signals with different frequencies propagate upstream, right? So the separation of time scales allows us to consider waves that have different periods, seasonal versus multi-annual waves. In, in both cases, on Jakob Shavin, these things are driven by migration of the calving front. So what we see in general is that higher frequency variations, of course, travel faster, and they decay over shorter distances than their lower wavelength components. And so that's what we're plotting here. So these are effectively space-time plots. It's essentially taking this movie and putting it out on the plot. And so these angles that you see propagating here, this is the phase velocity of the wave as it's moving forward. So perturbation that's occurring here at the calving front, and these things are all propagating upstream. Very different angles, so very different phase velocities between the high frequency and the relatively low frequency components. Go. What are these Oh yeah, so this is just a, these are just a, a rough estimate of what we would, we would consider to be a tracked value. This is a, well, let's call it a response to reviewers. Um. All right, and so, whereas a characteristic and a phase velocity would be this, this, uh, this, this linear line. Yeah. So we just wanted to show that if we plotted a, a constant value and how it moved upstream, there's some noise associated with it, but to a really good approximation, all except for this one, it follows a nice linear trend. Okay. All right, we're almost there. So we'll hypothesize that these things that we're observing are kinematic waves which is this redistribution of mass that we talked about before. We can't quite back that up with data just yet, but we're working on that uh, to understand what's going on. But with these observations, these really good quality observations that we get, we're able to compute the phase velocity uh, from the time-dependent velocity field. So, so the key points that we get, uh, the, the kinematic waves, the things that we observe on Jakob Chauvin are about one one-hundredth the speed of the waves that we that we observed on Redford Ice Stream. So the dynamical waves that we observed on Redford, this pulling, changing of the longitudinal stresses, propagating significantly faster than the things that we were observing uh, on Jakob Chauvin, even though Jakob Chauvin is a much, much faster flowing glacier in the end. So phase velocities uh, for these perturbations are traveling about 10 times the mean glacier flow speed. There are distinct regions of relatively fast glacier flow that are attributable to changes within the ice thickness. So we would definitely expect the rates of wave propagation and so forth will be strongly related to the localized thickness. But the seasonal signal propagates about twice as fast as the multi-year signal, which is awesome. So that means the waves, in this case, are dispersive. Right? And since the waves are dispersive, we can play all kinds of fun games and separating out the various components that are driving these things. All right? So very simple conceptual model that's going to wrap everything up for us as we get toward the end. Kinematic waves 
They're simply a wave driven by redistribution of mass that we talked about before. Classic example of this is traffic. Traffic is really well modeled as a kinematic wave. Also, I took this fun uh, picture of the snow creeping down the windshield of my car. And Jakob Schauben, uh, this wave is excited by the change in, uh, in the position of the calving front. So we get some acceleration near the terminus. It draws the surface down, steepens the surface slope, and thus increases gravitational driving stress in that particular area, causes local acceleration, and so on and so forth as you propagate upstream. The wave speed, or the phase velocity in this case, uh, is the rate of propagation of a point of constant mass flux through the system, and we can measure the phase velocity from these time-dependent surface velocity observations. Right? So we can do all kinds of fun stuff with it, but here's the simplest story that I can come up with to explain what we can do with it. So the phase velocities help constrain the drag at the bed and rheology of the ice. These basic ideas have been around for a long time. John and I published a paper on this about 60 years or so ago, uh, Response to Glaciers and Ice Sheets to Seasonal and Climatic Changes. In essence, thinking about kinematic waves, all we have to think about really is the continuity equation, or conservation of mass, if you will. That is simply uh, a first-order wave equation. And so we can take and we can simply rearrange this and we can write down an expression for the kinematic wave speed as a sensitivity of mass flux to ice thickness, okay? And then, of course, we have our sliding law from before. So Nye shows this really well, uh, so we won't go through all the steps, basically. But we can write down this very simple expression between the kinematic wave speed, this thing that we can observe with the remote sensing observations, as well as the mean surface velocity in this particular area. And we can write this down, again, as a function of the stress exponent and the rheology of ice, as well as the sliding law exponent m over here. So we don't really know this particular ratio, but we, so we can just treat it as an unknown, and we can carry forward and ask basic questions about well, what, these, uh, what these various things might be. So we can plot a potential value for the sliding law exponent, kind of lumped together for Jakob Schauben as a function of all possible values of this slip ratio, the sliding ratio. That is the ratio of the rate of slip along the bed to the total surface velocity up top. And then we can plot our different observations. So this is essentially bounding the lower bound from the observations and the upper bound from the observations and all possible stress exponents that could account for this. In a nutshell, what we get is that everything is really big in this particular area. There is no possible value of the stress exponent that is anything other than plastic that could, that could account for the observations that we see. Right? So there's no way around this general fact, even if we can't get precisely to this particular value, we can definitely say that from these observations that the bed of the glacier in Jakob Schauben has to be effectively plastic. Okay, and all this is consistent with this general emerging trend. Uh, I wrote down my opinion on this uh, in, in a, just in a perspectives piece that got published last year. It's a short and quick read uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in my thoughts on this. But basically, there's a whole bunch of emerging work done by other people uh, particularly some interesting stuff that's come out uh, from uh, Luke Zoot and Neil Iverson uh, that are looking at laboratory studies uh, of, of stresses versus sliding speed, so the sliding law um, in deformable beds. Christian Schuf has done a lot of work to look at this kind of thing in rigid beds, but in effect what they get is they get some sort of dependence between the drag at the bed and the sliding speed at relatively slow speeds, but then it all kind of tapers off and moves toward this sort of plastic sliding law as things start to move out and things start to flow faster. We inferred similar things. I did some work some years back. This is with Matthew and, and, and Helen when I, was, uh, when, when, uh, when I was a PhD student and learning a ton from them. Uh, we inferred the same kind of thing on some small ice caps uh, within central Iceland and so forth. So just to wrap things up, and then I'll have a couple of comments on, on sort of the path forward and this sort of thing. Uh, for the conclusions, what we talked about are two examples of observing uh, spatial temporal variations in ice surface velocity. As we were looking at the propagation of dynamical waves that were excited by ocean tides in one particular outlet glacier in West Antarctica, known as Redford Ice Stream. And then in the second example, we were constraining the propagation of kinematic waves that were excited by changes in the calving front position uh, in Yakovshav and Isbre uh, within our, in, uh, in West Antarctica. In both cases, we're able to measure the phase velocity, the attenuation length, and these measurements, these observations provide unique constraints on sort of the set of admissible physical models that could account for the mechanics of glacier beds and additionally the rheology of glacier ice. So both cases provide evidence that the beds in these areas are perfectly plastic. But all this sort of thing is kind of only the beginning. We have lots of new stuff um, that's sort of coming together. I'm just gonna put this movie up here. 
You show it, this is from observations. This is Pine Island Glacier in West Antarctica, one of the places that was changing quite a bit. So this is the response of the velocity field to calving uh, of the ice shelf itself. And so this is the relative velocity over here, and you can see you can see these icebergs start to form in this area. So you can see strain rates intensify kind of as this movie loops around. You'll see these strain rates intensify. You'll watch a rift as it propagates across, and whenever it connects with this particular margin, then we start to see this event speed up, and we watch that acceleration propagate across the ice shelf, and then it propagates across the grounding line and continues to move upstream. So we're doing a bit of work to, again, do this, sim this similar kind of concept. Uh, this is work that's led by uh, Eric Tamaray, another PhD candidate uh, that's working in my group. And finally, and sort of, this is all kind of generally part of this emerging remote sensing revolution. Uh, so we have satellites and satellite constellations that are going up from governments and commercial agencies and so forth. All these things give us an increasing data quality and quantity. A lot of this stuff is done on, under open data policies, and so we just have tons and tons of new data and information available to us. Right? And a lot of this gives us this nice improved temporal resolution. It gives us temporal resolutions of sort of kind of, of, of scale of hours to weeks, somewhere around in there. On the atmospheric side of things, uh, we have UAVs and light aircraft that are, uh, that are gaining increasingly remarkable characteristics. Uh, so we can use off-the-shelf instruments and software. We can develop customizable observational plans using these things. And we are currently working on some systems, uh, this particular aircraft uh, shown over here in the picture, that should be able to fly for three to four months at a time, collecting continuous observations, repeat times of like 30 minutes to a few hours, something like that, covering kind of some of the more interesting portions uh, of the ice sheets. And so this gives us the ability to have this future where we have continuous remote sensing observations with sampling periods of sort of minutes to days. So we'll actually be able to see things like rifts propagating across ice shelves. We'll actually be able to constrain many more, many more frequencies of variations and so forth that we observe and whatnot. But all these bits kind of working together from the satellite side, everything's moving towards smaller, lighter, cheaper. From the fixed wing side, we're moving toward longer endurance, flexible platforms and things relatively cheap. And so all this is gonna to move to the future where we have improved spatial and temporal resolution. So we're gonna be able to do some really remarkable things in kind of the next five to 10 years or so, hopefully. That's it, that's all I got for you.